Hi, good morning. And uh, thanks to Dr. Bertovsek and Dr. Uh, Manuki for the invitation. So this is... Okay. This would be my proposed algorithm for the treatment of patients with myelofibrosis based on the risk of the disease. So, clearly, for patients with intermediate to uh, high risk, uh, the recommendation, if they are eligible for transplantation, is allogeneic transplantation. But we know that the majority of patients are not eligible because they are older or they are not in a very good condition. So, if this is not possible, then uh, symptom adjusted therapy, and when there is no response, they are eligible for investigational drugs. So, this is very clear. I would say that everybody would agree with this. But what about patients in the earlier uh, risk uh, group, in the earlier phases of the disease, patients with low or intermediate one risk myelofibrosis? We know that these patients had a relative long uh, life expectancy. For instance, patients with low risk myelofibrosis during the first five years had the same mortality than the control population, while patients with intermediate one risk uh, during the first three years had the same mortality. And then the disease progresses and there is a, a short, uh, shortening of the survival. So, for these patients, this would be the uh, uh, proposed algorithm. So, if patients uh, are asymptomatic, they don't need any treatment because they don't have symptoms. Their life expectancy is long, relatively long. So, wait and watch. While for patients uh, who are symptomatic, of course, symptom adjusted therapy. But which uh, early uh, phase in myelofibrosis patients are in need of treatment. In patients with low risk myelofibrosis, only patients with symptomatic splenomegaly. So by definition, they don't have anemia, they don't have constitutional symptoms, they don't have severe uh, leukocytosis, so they don't have any of the poor pronostic feature, but a minority of them can have uh, symptomatic splenomegaly. This is not very frequent in this patient, but it can be the case that some patients need treatment just because they had a symptomatic splenomegaly. And in the case of intermediate one risk uh, myelofibrosis, they need treatment because they can have anemia. Anemia is one of the poor pronostic factors, or they can have constitutional symptoms, another poor pronostic factor, or they can have a symptomatic splenomegaly. So there are more patients in the intermediate uh, one risk group who are in need of treatment for different reasons. Which would be the treatment? The treatment, as you know, in myelofibrosis, in the absence of uh, uh, criteria for uh, transplantation, is a symptom adjusted therapy. That in the case of the anemia, we had different. Uh, drugs or procedure like erythropoiesis stimulating agents, androgens, immunomodulators, splenectomy, or prednisone. While for patients with symptomatic splenomegaly or constitutional symptoms, we had nowadays the JAK inhibitor, the only approved drug is uh, rupsolitinib, or we can use, maybe if, we are not, uh, if the drug is not available or in certain situation, we can use uh, cytoreductive drugs such as hydroxyurea or even interferon, splenectomy, or splenic radiation. While for patients with extramedullary disease, we can uh, always the uh, possibility of radiation therapy. What about the use of uh, the JAK inhibitor? And when I say JAK inhibitor, I will refer to ruxolitinib because it's the only drug that we can use in clinical practice in patients with intermediate one risk myelofibrosis. We know that in the phase three studies, only patients with intermediate two and high risk myelofibrosis were included. So the uh, data in intermediate one risk patients are very limited. This data can uh, 
while we are now waiting for the result that I know that will be presented at IHA on the JAM study that could include some patients with intermediate one risk myelofibrosis. But for the time being, we had the data from a British study, which is the Robert study, in which uh, some patients with intermediate, uh, intermediate one risk uh, myelofibrosis were included. And as uh, you can see, in this patient, there was a clear effect on the reduction on the spleen in those patients who were treated because of symptomatic splenomegaly. And the same applies to constitutional symptoms. So this is in orange, and you can see that there were uh, patients who clearly responded to constitutional symptoms as expected, because we know that in intermediate two and high-risk uh, myelofibrosis, the patient respond very well to ruxolitinib when they have uh, constitutional symptoms. But this is for patients who are symptomatic. But what about asymptomatic patients? Is treatment justified in uh, patients who are asymptomatic and had early phase myelofibrosis? The answer would be yes, only if a given therapy, we don't know which, we know which, <laughs> can cure the disease without a, a substantial associated mortality risk. Or a, a given therapy, an next therapy, can delay the progression of the disease and modify the, the natural history of the disease. Problems now. Concerning the cure of the disease, for the time being, the only therapy that can cure myelofibrosis is allogeneic transplantation. And it can be performed either in the, with a myeloablative uh, conditioning or more recently and more frequently with reduced intensity conditioning. And overall, the results, I would say, that are, are rather similar. There is probably more mortality with the myeloablative uh, conditioning, but in the long term, long term in myelofibrosis means five, five years, the overall survival will be about 50, 60 percent. And most of the mortality is due to transplant-related mortality. There are about 20 percent of relapses following transplantation, but most of the mortality is early mortality due to the procedure to transplantation. But there are some groups that had claimed that probably uh, transplantation should be performed at uh, even in patients with uh, earlier phases of the disease, with low risk or intermediate one risk. And we had here some example. This, sorry. This data correspond to the uh, series of the uh, uh, of CRL, showing that in low risk patients, the survival is 80% and intermediate one risk patients is about 70, uh, less than 70%. And this is another uh, series from Europe showing that the mortality uh, of this uh, patient would be uh, low, but very similar to the, to the previous one. But there are other series, including uh, more patients from different centers, showing that although the uh, survival of patients transplanted in low or intermediate one risk uh, myelofibrosis is uh, better than that of patients transplanted with intermediate two or high risk, the uh, survival is not uh, uh, spectacular. So there is uh, an important mortality. And in order to answer this, we have now more data. This is a recent uh, study uh, comparing uh, patients from, uh, with, uh, from different uh, risk group, myelofibrosis, treated with conventional treatment and or with transplantation. It was a comparison of two historical series. It has a limitation, but to have an idea, yeah, I think that this is important. So as you can see, for patients with intermediate to uh, high-risk myelofibrosis, clearly the advantage would be for a uh, transplantation, as we already suspected. But for patients with low risk myelofibrosis, clearly the advantage would be for a conventional treatment, not transplantation, because there are mortality derived from the procedure. 
And in patients with intermediate one risk, uh, the uh, advantage would be also for uh, conventional treatment, at least for the first years. So at the end, there's uh, the two uh, uh, curves converge, but during the several years, there is an advantage of uh, conventional treatment. So based on this result and uh, the uh, consensus, the opinion of the expert and also other pieces of the literature, uh, a recent uh, consensus agreed with the indication for transplantation in patients with myelofibrosis. So for patients with height and intermediate to risk myelofibrosis, uh, the uh, agreement was to proceed to transplantation if they were below the age of 70 years, and of course, the general condition was not very, very bad. And uh, we opened uh, the possibility of transplantation in patients with intermediate one risk myelofibrosis, but for patients slightly younger, below the age of 65 years, who had intermediate one, but with some of this condition, transfusion-dependent anemia, or anemia which is refractory to treatment, or uh, more than 2% blast in the peripheral blood, or adverse cytogenetics, and even, uh, as I will mention later, we could consider some molecular data. But these are a minority of patients. There are a few patients from, uh, of, of those in intermediate one risk myelofibrosis. And we know uh, nowadays that, uh, thanks to the studies from the Florence group and also from other groups, that uh, in addition to the driver mutation, to the MP driver mutation, JAK2, CALAR, and MPL, there are other mutations which are not uh, exclusive of the MPN. They are shared by other myelodysplasia, such as the myelodysplasia or even acute myeloid leukemia, that have a clear impact on the survival of the patients. So, ASXL1, is, uh, CH2, RSSF2. And based on the present and the number of these uh, poor prognosis mutation, they uh, identified a, a high risk uh, molecular group and low risk molecular group with a very different uh, survival. And uh, of a note, most of these uh, non-driver mutations with advert prognosis are in the, uh, not uh, unexpectedly, in the high-risk group. So in this group, we, we wouldn't need to perform this mutation because the patient had already a very poor group, and also in the intermediate two-risk group. But of note, there was all, uh, approximately one-fifth of the patient in the uh, low and intermediate one-risk group who uh, harbor this poor prognosis mutation. So this can be another uh, additional reason to consider in a specific patient the possibility, if they are very young, et cetera, the possibility of uh, transplantation. And not only the non-driver mutation. We know that uh, now that we have the driver mutation, the three driver mutation, that patients uh, who are triple negative who lack the three mutation had an adverse prognosis. So this would be also a, a group with a special poor prognosis in, in whom it could be considered the possibility of treating the patient with transplantation or with aggressive therapy. I must say that most, if not all, of these patients, because uh, the data are lacking, belong to advanced uh, risk group. It's very unlikely that uh, many of these patients are in the low risk group or inter intermediate one risk group. This uh, was mostly related to uh, transplantation, the only therapy that can cure the disease. But what about the novel drugs, such as the JAK inhibitor? Can they delay the progression or uh, modify the natural history of the disease? We know that these drugs are very effective in reducing the spleen, in improving the quality of life, even they can prolong survival. But what about other uh, aspects of the disease, more profound of the, of the disease, such as, for instance, the 
reduction of the Jack 2 allele burden in those patients who are, of course, Jack 2 positive. So these are the results of the Comfort 2 study at five years. And as you can see, there were some patients in whom there was a marked uh, reduction of the Jack 2 allele burden, but in general, the reduction of the Jack 2 allele burden was modest. Another aspect is the fibrosis. So uh, the reduction in the fibrosis is in, in green. So more patients in the ruxolitinib R had reduction of the fibrosis as compared with the best available therapy. But overall, I would say that this is not an important effect of uh, ruxolitinib, so no clear effect in aspect that we consider that uh, could modify the disease, especially the JAK2. And although uh, it, it, uh, it is a matter of debate, because some uh, meta-analysis had uh, questioned the, the uh, survival prolongation with ruxolitinib in the comfort studies, uh, and this is mainly because the two studies were not designed to detect a survival advantage, uh, and especially because patients in the two other R, the placebo or the best available therapy, were crossover to ruxolitinib. But now we had modern uh, statistical methods that can compensate for this uh, crossover. And by using this method, uh, we can uh, see how uh, receiving ruxolitinib at front for those patients who need ruxolitinib, so symptomatic patients, uh, this uh, results in a survival advantage. I, I, would, th I would say that this is clear because uh, when these patients improve a lot and they had uh, uh, an improvement in many aspects of their quality of life, they are, they are less vulnerable. And overall, I would say that despite the pros and the cons of survival, yes or not, I would say that probably this patient had also, uh, in addition to the clinical improvement, a prolongation in the survival. But the use of a uh, JAK inhibitor is not uh, uh, had some risk. For instance, the risk of developing some infection. It has been uh, uh, mentioned before that some of these patients develop uh, some infection, such as opportunistic infection, herpes softer, tuberculosis, etc. I would say that in general, since we are treating many patients with ruxolitinib, this is not something that uh, concerns us in, in patients with myelofibrosis because they need uh, treatment. But this is something that we must consider in patients that are asymptomatic and had a very prolonged uh, life expectancy. And even in some cases, uh, there is a certain increase in the uh, proportion of patients developing second malignancies. It's not very marked, but there is a, a trend towards this uh, kind of complication. So, uh, ruxolitinib uh, in a symptomatic patient with early phase myelofibrosis, I, in my opinion, I think that for the time being, this is an investigational approach because we need robust uh, data showing a clear disease-modifying uh, effect. And for the time being, we don't have this data. And the cons would be that patients are asymptomatic. And as uh, I had mentioned before, there is cert, uh, uh, some uncertainty on the possible effect of the prolonged JAK inhibition in patients who had a long life expectancy, which is not the case in patients with intermediate 2 or high-risk myelofibrosis. And in order to answer uh, this uh, question, there is a trial nowadays, which is a recruiting patient, which is the rethink trial in patient with early myelofibrosis, but only those patients, sorry, only those patients who had a poor uh, molecular prognostic uh, mutation. So patient would be randomized if they had this mutation to ruxolitinib or placebo in order to see uh, we need a lot of time, a prolonged time, if there is an advantage of using uh, the drug in this uh, minority of very selective patients. But in addition to the uh, JAK inhibitor, we had other drug that had been uh, previously mentioned by Dr. Kiladjian, which is interferon. 
We know that interferon is not a, a new drug. It has been used for many years in its uh, form and formulation. And even with this formulation that was uh, poorly tolerated, especially considering that many uh, myelofibrosis patients are elderly people, there were some uh, patients in whom uh, there was a uh, reversal of the fibrosis. So there are some indication that uh, it could be possible with, with uh, interferon in myelofibrosis. This corresponds to a, a paper published by Dr. Silver showing in a patient with myelofibrosis the evolution of the bone marrow before treatment with interferon and after interferon. So this is possible. It was a minority of patients, but there are some such patients. And now we had the pegylated form of interferon. We know that uh, apparently this form is better tolerated than the conventional form. But uh, when we uh, see, uh, when we look at the patient, maybe not in uh, Pivera or in ED, but in myelofibrosis, there is a continuous drop off of patients because of maybe the tolerability is not as good as it is claimed by the people who are uh, in. Uh, pro-interferon, pro the use uh, of interferon in this patient. So I wonder whether these patients who are asymptomatic would be willing to accept uh, some symptoms uh, derived from the uh, therapy in order to achieve a possible, not uh, very clear, uh, delay in the disease progression. I know that uh, some people like Dr. Hasselbach, Dr. Silver, had a meeting last weekend in Nice, and they were a strong supporter of using interferon up front in very early patients. But I would say that this is a matter of debate, and we need data, and we need probably a randomized study comparing uh, interferon versus nothing, and then to show what happened with the fibrosis and with all the aspects of the disease. So this would be my conclusion. So clearly we had an indication for the use of uh, JAK inhibitor in patients with uh, advanced phases or with symptoms, but the treatment of uh, asymptomatic patients is still controversial. We can consider allogeneic transplantation in patients uh, with intermediate one risk myelofibrosis who had additional features that we know that are associated with a worse uh, outcome, but uh, the, current, uh, the current evidence of drugs that can uh, that had the potential to delay the progression of myelofibrosis is weak, where the possible side effects of the new drugs in this specific population of patients in the long term are of concern. So uh, the role of this approach should be restricted to the investigational setting. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>